Hello there. And it all comes down to one word, everything that's going on at the moment. In England, Northern Ireland, France, Germany, and so many countries around the world at the moment, all at the same time comes down to one word, and it's trauma. So since I made my last film about reading the news, which was some days ago, I have been going through so much and I've had so many feelings. It's been an incredibly challenging time to be who I am because who I am is someone who feels the hurt, feels the pain. And that's in a generalized sense because that's what we've got going on. We have a world awash in trauma. That's what's going on. And that is the explanation for why people are doing what they're doing. When people are going through severe trauma or have been through severe trauma, they tend to get into an adrenalized state. That's adrenaline is just flowing through their body, through their bloodstream in an excessive way. This tends to give rise to the adrenalized responses. Number one, to fight. There's a lot of fighting going on at the moment. And the other one is to flight. A lot of people fleeing, running away. People are literally fleeing from their ancestral lands. And they're not doing so because they want a better lifestyle somewhere else. They're doing it because they're being terrorised by their own despotic, tyrannical governments, rulers, warlords, landlords, bosses, whatever it might happen to be. And it's going on all over the world. And it's been going on for a long time. It's just it's finally reached the soft underbelly of Northwestern Europe, which effectively is what these isles represent. So as people in England are, many of them are very angry. So that's one thing, people fight, people flee. Footage of people running for their lives in the UK when they're being chased by people with knives and machetes. It's all going on. Those are two responses, to fight and to flee, but there are two more I want to speak about. And the third one is to freeze. That's pretty much what's happened to me. After what I've been through this summer, I keep going into my freeze response, whereby I literally freeze up and can't do anything. It is one of the most immensely frustrating states of existence, I find, because I've got so much experience of it. I had an illness called Emmy, which lasted for an incredibly long time. I basically was frozen for that length of time, except for the moments when I was able to act and function. But this is not about me, this is about everyone. And then in 2020, we had a worldwide traumatisation event. People locked up, people told what to do, people under very strict controls, all the things that they usually do to divert and distract themselves, like the shops, the clothing, the shopping centres all closed. It's not that long ago. It's only a few years ago, isn't it? And now what about Britain itself? Britain and Ireland two tiny islands. Back in the 20th century, Britain was known as a tiny overcrowded island. So many people, huge number of people per square mile. Yes, Holland and Japan do exceed us, but we've got a lot of people in a very small space. Just contrast it with America, Canada, Australia, many parts of the world, lots of space, parts of China, Russia, my goodness me, how much space is there in Russia? We're tiny, we're overcrowded. And the natural response for the British 
is to feel like they're being invaded. Now we've been invaded before, we were invaded by the Romans, that was a long time ago. We were invaded by the Normans, that was the only successful invasion that ever took place in this country. We repelled all the rest, or they just disintegrated like the Roman Empire, just disintegrated and left us all these wonderful roads and monuments. But no, the Norman invasion was successful, that's the only one we've ever had. And the invasion from the Nazis in World War Two failed. But here we are now, and it's been going on for about a quarter of a century or longer, people just turning up on our shores. So from the English perspective, people are angry, people are frightened, and some people are out in the streets fighting, other people are running from others that are pursuing them. A lot of people are going into freeze mode. And what I'm noticing is my conversations with people as I go about my days, everyone, virtually everyone is ignoring it. No one is speaking about it wherever I go. If I don't bring the subject up, it's like the heads are in the sand. That's part of the freeze response. And there's another response which is a lot more controversial and it's called the fawn response. When people are in severely traumatic states, what they do is they start to become very appeasing. They start to become ingratiating. They start to do everything they can to make themselves as unthreatening as possible by toadying around people, groveling around people and all that kind of stuff. That's what people do who fawn. They basically become fake. They're doing everything they can to placate anyone because they don't want to be violated. So these are your four trauma response to fight, to flee, to freeze, to fawn. These are the four Fs of trauma. Now, it's not just the people, the native residents, the indigenous English people that are experiencing this. All the people that are turning up on our shores are in a significantly more traumatised state. I sometimes feel when I'm watching various YouTube reports about what's going on at the moment, particularly in England, but also a bit in other countries too, is that people genuinely believe that these migrants get beamed up by the Starship Enterprise from their homelands and get beamed down onto tiny inflatable boats about two miles away from the coast and then they attempt to gain entry to this country. I think that's genuinely what people think because people don't seem to have any idea of what they've been through. Now I've been aware of this for a depressing long time one of the things that's really hard about being a shaman is to know stuff much longer before other people do. And we go through this, well, if we tell them, they're just not going to believe us. They're just going to laugh in our faces. And then finally, when the shit hits the fan, well, that's it. Now everyone's kind of seeing what's going on. But unlike some people like myself, I've been researching this subject for almost a quarter of a century. I can remember watching a documentary in the days long, long, long ago when I would actually watch the BBC. Hard to imagine I ever did, but it is. And they were saying, there's this coastline of North Africa and there's this coastline of Southern Europe. And what is happening is, it's going to happen, it's starting and it's inevitable. And that was the mass migration. So it's been known for that long. So what I've done is I've researched in the way I prefer to do, which is to not go online. I and mean, a lot of that time, it, online didn't even exist. So I did what I've always done. I read books, I read fiction, I read non-fiction, I read autobiography, I read biography. And that's such a helpful way to understand. So I want you to understand this. If you're an indigenous person living in your country and you're being invaded by others from other countries, this is what I want you to know. These people who are invading are not people who are bored with their lifestyle in their homelands 
and they want to earn some more money and they want to have a bit of an easier ride and get benefits. None of them are here for that. I'll tell you why they're here, because I've read about it so many times in so many situations. They are terrorised by their own despotic, tyrannical governments, warlords or regimes. They fear for their lives, they watch people close to them dying in horrible ways and eventually can't stand this anymore. And they take part in what is a worldwide orchestrated business. There's no other way to see it. It's a business. People are making fortunes off people who are terrorised and in fear of their lives and sanity in all the countries where they're being brutalised by their regimes. And what happens is they embark upon the trail and it's an absolutely hideous experience and what happens is they get to hand over large sums of money and then a bunch of criminals, because this is criminal business we're talking about, a bunch of criminals will then take them from where they are or maybe that's not even an option, maybe they have to walk for a very very long time in a very long way until they finally reach someone who is going to assist them with their travels, part with the money. They get crammed into vehicles, often in 40, 50 degree temperatures. Some of them die on the journey and they get taken somewhere. And the somewhere is some kind of a compound. It's like a very small concentration camp. And they get dumped out of the vehicles and put in there. They're in prison, basically. And they are put there and they're told they're gonna stay there until they can come up with someone who they can phone who they can extort money out of and they will take them to the next part on their journey. And this process repeats and repeats and they have to do everything they can to obtain money somehow. And those that don't, don't come to a very nice end, let's just put it that way, because the whole thing is money driven. And there's a name and the, the surname is Soros, S-O-R-O-S. That's a starting point in terms of your research rabbit hole. If you want to understand what's going on, don't take my word on any of this stuff. Don't. Find it all out for yourself. Come on. You've got a brain. Use it. So I'm just reporting what I know, right? And eventually they come to a body of water at some point. In the case of a lot of the ones that come to us, they come across two bodies of water. The body of water that blocks them off from southern Europe and when they're in southern Europe they've got the English Channel to deal with if they get this far. And they experience all sorts of things. It's horrendous, it's traumatic. They are generally treated like trash wherever they go and so much more so in more recent times. 15 years ago it wasn't so bad but whenever they get to somewhere and they feel like they can just exhale, relax and breathe, no. It's not safe, it's not safe. And when they finally arrive in this country through a terrible crossing, then how are they going to be received and treated as well? The authorities seem to be treating them one way and the people who are really pissed off are treating them another way and that's completely unsurprising. But what I want you to understand, the reason I'm giving you that level of detail and I'm so grateful to one of my close friends for sharing this little detail with me. Her trauma was so extreme and severe that it put her into a state whereby she didn't give a monkey about anybody else's feelings because her trauma was completely dominating her existence all the time. That's pretty much how all these migrants arrive. That's the state they're in. They are so brutalised from the horrific journey, watching people die on the journey, ill-treated in their own home countries. And there's the other bit that people don't ever speak about, so I'm going to speak about it on their behalf. Unlike in our part of the world in Western Europe and here in England, most of these people have got a very strong connection to their families, their ancestors and their ancestral lands. 
Now, if you think about the Native Americans, we know how they are about their ancestral lands. If you take a Native American away from their ancestral land, it's like you're cutting off their feet. It's that extreme. There are many, many other people that actually have this sense of connection. Now, the Industrial Revolution is what almost destroyed this connection in this country. And I'm one of a very small number of people that has made a really good reconnection with my ancestors because I know how important my ancestors are. I thank my ancestors every single day for their gifts. To me, this is an absolutely essential thing to do because I spent almost all my life in neglecting and ignoring them. And I learned something from an indigenous person on a stage in Manchester quite a long time ago. This is what he said. He said, if you ignore your ancestors, they will run amok in your lives. And that is a deep shamanic truth. This is all my shamanic understanding. So what I want to say to you is I've spent days preparing to make this film. And every time I've prepared to sit in front of the camera, it was always I've been blocked and I've been stopped because I hadn't reached the root cause, but it is trauma and the effects of trauma. So these people have experienced unspeakable brutality. They've been driven from their homelands, their ancestral lands. A lot of them have lost members of their family. One of the things people complain about is that it all seems to be males that's arriving. And there's something that's deeply suspicious and dodgy about that. But on the other hand, just imagine how many of them have actually lost some or all of their families. That's also part of the picture that people haven't been choosing to look at. So they've got broken families. Well, we've got broken families because we've got so many families which are broken. So this is what we know about too. They are divorced from their ancestral lands to such an extent they move to a different constant, most of them. This means that they are disconnected in a way which is so terrifying, it's purely unconscious. For people who've lived, and I, I need to share this, a year ago, a year ago, yeah, I went to an event, and there's a woman there in the camp, and she was from Iran, and she spoke about the fact that she lives in London, and the whole family had to make this choice, the whole family realised that situations are getting so difficult for them, they would have to sell their ancestral lands. So from this woman's point of view, she was in her 40s. It, she didn't even sell the land, it was a family decision. So she was disenfranchised from her land and she felt absolutely dreadful. And she'd come to London because she didn't know what the hell to do with herself. I, sorry, it chokes me up this because I've got deep empathy for people who have a connection to lands. And I'll tell you this, I didn't used to think I had because my ancestors all come from the north of England, from the county of Yorkshire. And here I am down in the southwest of England. But what I've come to realise, I've, I've had a lot of reframing to do. One of the things I've realised, so long as I live in England, this is me living in my ancestral lands. So I'm saying this to all the indigenous people in this country. I'm making a very strong recommendation. First of all, please realise wherever in England you are living, if you're an English person, same for the Welsh, same for the Scottish, same for the Irish, recognise that you're on your ancestral lands. We have a connection to our lands and this is a very powerful thing. Also, if you choose to become aware of their significance, like me and others, you will then have a sense of being connected with your ancestors. Every day I pray and I thank my ancestors. Every day I pray and I thank my parents who are now both passed into the spirit realm. These are some of the most valuable spiritual practices I've taken on. Really important. This is what I want all the indigenous people to know. Of whatever nation you are, if you're living where you, your ancestry comes from, this is what you have. Your ancestors, especially if you thank them, they have your backs. I want to go into a bit of detail about this. I'm an Englishman. And I never thought I'd ever say the word, but I am actually proud of it. And why not? And whatever nationality you are, whatever person you are, having some pride in your ancestry and your ancestral lands is a really important thing. Because I know 
And if I go back, English people have great strength. They've got great inner strength. And the people that are newcomers to this country would be advised to realise this. Because on the surface, a lot of English people that might look to them pretty overweight, pretty couch potato-ish, and pretty easy game. You are so wrong. We are very, very strong, powerful people. It comes from our ancestors. Because our ancestors are why we are alive. I really want you to get this and understand it. You only exist because of your ancestors. And your ancestors went through all sorts of shit. And whatever it was flung at them, they made it through. And you know they made it through because you're alive. The ones that didn't make it through weren't able to produce children, some of them. Some of them did before they died, but a lot of them didn't. But we're talking about the ones that did. So we are alive thanks to them. And look what they went through in the 20th century. Two horrific world wars. Trauma on a scale a lot of us don't even begin to truly understand. Because the people that went through it are mostly passed into spirit now. But that's in our ancestry. We have the terrible times of the poverty of the 20th century, particularly at the end of the 1920s and the 1930s, leading up to World War II. Terrible economic hardships, people not having enough food to eat, people walking for hundreds of miles, hunger marches, people so bloody hungry, so desperate to make the overlords in the parliament wake up to what was being done to us. So people have been starved, they've been bombed, they've been gassed, they've been brutalised. Indigenous English people, and that's only in the 20th century. And if you go back further, it goes on. The people, the ones that have worked in the factories, that have made everything as it is, the ones that have grown our food, these are our ancestors. Now I'm going to take you back a long, long way, back until what was the medieval era. So in 1066, the English lost the war, and the Normans won the war, and everything changed. And we were herded into enclaves, and this is the way it worked. You had the lord of the manor, he had his manor house, and he had his serfs. So that's what the indigenous people were. And this went on for hundreds of years. Now the serf is a very, very special category of human being. It's not the same as a slave, not quite. And it's not the same as a downtrodden worker. It's really quite different. It's not someone in minimum wage. Very, very different. So this is what would happen. This is how it was for so many years. And the important point I want you to get is that all our ancestors went through this shit and they survived and they produced children and that's why we're alive. So for six days of the week, the serfs were working for the lord of the manor and he had his overseers which kept everybody in line and they were doing all the jobs that needed to be done, growing all the food so that the lords could live in the lap of luxury and have such things as their wheat milled into white flour, which was the ultimate luxury in those times, and be able to have food that had sweetener in, like honey. Such things weren't available for the serfs, but that's how it was. Lots of animal food, lots of animal protein. So they were doing all the work to keep the lords in the lap of luxury for six days a week. Yeah, six days a week, and for one day a week, they weren't working for the Lord, what would they do? They were compelled to go to church in the morning and speak words which they didn't understand in a foreign language called Latin. Their religion was such they didn't even know what was being said. They hadn't a bloody clue, but that's what they did. And as soon as the church service was over, what they did is they would spend the rest of the day working on their strips. So every family of serfs, so you've got the man, the wife and the children. The wife and the children are doing everything to keep their little domain going at home. They're living in a hovel, a tiny 
very poorly equipped home, made of stone with thatched roof most likely if they were lucky, and they have a tiny strip of land, each surf domain has got a tiny strip of land and they grow all their produce to feed themselves on that. That's how they get fed. They get fed from what they're able to grow. Has a very harsh, hard life. And whenever the Lord of the Manor was compelled to do so by the king or some other person in a superior rank to the Lord of the Manor, he would then have to call up his serfs and tell them, OK, guys, you're no longer working six days a week for me now. You're often you're going to fight a stupid bloody war somewhere and you may or may not come back. And there's nothing you can do about it. Here's some basic equipment. Right, sod off a lot of you. Or he might take them himself or he might have his overseers send them. Or like as not some one in authority from somewhere higher up would take them away. So either you worked so hard, the likes of which we can't even imagine, and survived that, and every now and again you got given some crude weapons and went off to go and have a war and kill and be killed. And that went on for hundreds of years. So newcomers to this country don't be fooled into thinking that they're just a bunch of soft nellies, the people in this country, because they've got their ancestors' blood flowing in their veins. We have our ancestors' blood flowing in our veins and we are so much stronger and tougher than even we might realise at first glance. And our ancestors, most particularly if you bother to thank them for your existence, they have your backs. And this isn't just applying to people in England, this applies to people all over the world. But here's the exception. I feel so much compassion for the indigenous English people. I feel so much compassion for the newcomers. So the newcomers have lost everything. They've lost their homes. A lot of them have lost their families. And they've lost their connection with their ancestral lands. And as I've said, for, for people who have a clear awareness of this, who've not been brutalised by the Industrial Revolution. That's something else. We were brutalised by the Industrial Revolution and the children were made to work in the factories. Remember this, for peanuts. And that went on for many, many years, Victorian era particularly. That's when most most of the, our ancestors were brought up to be children and work in factories, mines. Yeah, horrific conditions. This is what we're going on. This is worldwide trauma. And what's happening, it's all coming out now. So I've got so much compassion for the people that effectively their connection to their ancestral hands is gone. It's like someone's cut off their feet in terms of their feels. So they are so deeply upset by all that. And just like my friend I was telling you about, have reached a point that they are so lost they don't give a about anyone other than themselves. That's why there's so much appalling behaviour at the moment. And there's so much anger and so much fear. That's the other thing. While all this stuff is being going on, I have had so many years of my life, frankly, not experiencing fear. But I experienced naked, unbridled terror as a child. And what's been going on since this... this whatever it is is going on. I'm being triggered massive by all that's going on now and I'm being triggered massive by all that went on in my childhood. So I've got a double freeze going on. That's why it's been such a job to make this film. Incredibly difficult to function at the moment. And I do what I need to do and not a lot else, frankly. And I receive all the help that I can from another direction and I'm so grateful to my bone therapist, my man body gets completely out of balance by all the trauma it's being racked with. She clears up. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm so grateful to everyone that is aware of what I want to say now. Bottom line, everyone is traumatised to fuck. That's what's going on. Everyone is traumatised to fuck. They are. And because of that, 
It means that people have gone nuts. People have gone nuts. People have gone crazy. Crazy people everywhere. That's what we've got going on. It's a mad, mad world. So what can we do? What we can do is we can keep our cool. We can remember to breathe deeply. And we can remember that wherever we go, whenever we see someone walking around with two arms ahead, two legs, that's a human. And we can be compassionate towards all humans because we haven't a clue what their personal story is. But I've given the game away. It's a, it's a story of trauma, it's a tale of woe, pretty much guaranteed. Everyone's been through that. 2020, 2021, 2022, trauma. Everything else, trauma, ancestors, trauma, daily lives, fear, all the rest of it. This is what we're dealing with. So be kind, be compassionate, be aware and send a blessing if I see someone behaving like an arse these days, I just send them a blessing. If someone behaves in a way which I think is, what the hell did you do that for? Some crazy behaviour in the car. Send them a blessing. Send them a blessing. And stay away from places where people are likely to beat the shit out of you. This does seem to be a little bit common sense but if there's a place where you're likely to get brutalised and attacked, maybe it might be an idea to do what you can to avoid it. Right? And that's not possible for everyone because people are experiencing such things just outside their front doors in residential areas. I had a phone call with a good friend yesterday afternoon. She's been around a while. She was in a riot a long time ago. She was in her own home with her own husband and a mob run past an attack to police station and then some of the mob peeled off the big procession and went into her garden and her husband grabbed her by the hand, pulled her through the house, out through the back door and they just walked carefully, mindfully and quietly away. Sometimes just getting out of a flashpoint is one of the wisest things you can do. Be safe, be as safe as you can. And look after each other. We all need to look after each other. How are you? How are you handling it? And to be aware that a lot of people can't cope with even talking about it. They don't know how to, they are so frozen that as far as they're concerned, they're not even able to articulate that it's happening. They need a lot of compassion. Big blessing to them. So love to you all in these times, whatever country you're living in, whatever it is you're going through at this time, and keep the intent to get through this, because there's more to come when this madness changes, because everything changes, always, all the time. That's the nature of reality, isn't it? Everything changes. And keep the faith going, going through the madness. All love to you.